Good afternoon. Welcome to the UCLA Department of Political Sciences E. Victor Wolfenstein Political Theory Lecture. I'm happy to introduce myself, Abel Valenzuela. I serve as Interim Dean of Social Sciences here at UCLA. Some of you might know, I've, I've been here for a long time, 30 plus years. And so it allows me certain sorts of privileges and insights, um, one of which is the naming of today's lecture. Um, I remember um, clearly um, our department um, and its origins. It was fraught. It was over a hunger strike. There was lots of attention, lots of conflict. Um, but the department was created nonetheless. Um, six faculty were hired, four of which um, arrived. I was one of those four. And I still remember it was a very interesting time on our campus, but there was a few key colleagues who reached out um, in support of what our campus was doing in this regard. Um, Victor was one of those um, individuals who showed support, empathy, and support of the creation of what was then the Cesar E. Chavez Department of Chicano and Chicana Studies. It's now um, been named to include Central American Studies as well, and so I'm very proud to say that. Um, thank you for joining us today for this really important discussion on James Baldwin and the continued movement for racial equality. In the social sciences, we really do value these very important conversations um, because they really do deepen, deepen our understanding of critical social issues that shape and that affect the world that we're in. And so today, we're really, really excited for lots of different reasons. Um, and I won't introduce him other than in name only because um, we will have a much more appropriate introduction of Dr. Melvin Rogers. In many ways, it's coming back home, um, though we're still working on that. <laughs> coming back home, and we're working hard to make that happen. As you all know, um, because Melvin is so well known to our campus and, of course, outside, he is a, the preeminent scholar of African American political thought. Um, and that ranks him as one of the greatest thinkers, um, not just in terms of African American, um, but in terms of political science, political theory. And he's here today sharing his insights and perspective on uh, today's talk. So now let me um, transition to introduce um, the chair of political science. Um, I've become quite close to him in the short eight months that we've been working together, though I knew Davide. Um, previously to his appointment as chair, and so it was one of the really um, nice things about stepping into this role, being able to work with a colleague who I knew previously, and as you all know, um, he's doing a great job, I believe, leading the department. So, Davide, um, please um, come up and um, do your introductions. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, this is a really great uh, pleasure to be here today, uh, not only because um, you know, I'm passionate as a professor of political theory, but because we're all here together for the first time in many, many years because of all of the unfortunate experiences we've all had to endure uh, through COVID and all of the things that kept us apart. And so it's, uh, it's a distinct pleasure uh, to be able to be here in person. And so, you know, these kinds of things can't happen without people who help us organize this and specifically uh, all of uh, our friends in the development office, Peter and Reha, most importantly, uh, and, every, and the staff in political science who's done a lot to uh, make coordinate uh, this event and make it possible. Uh, I'm extremely grateful. Um, one of the, be one of the I, I had a colleague once say to, or not a colleague, but I was a student at the time, and he was, uh, a, uh, he was a young scholar uh, who had become, a, where I was studying graduate, uh, doing my graduate work, he had become the chair of uh, the classics department, uh, Matthew Roller, whom you know. Um, and uh, uh, I bumped into him, I'd become friends with him over, over the years while I was studying, and I said to Matthew, it's nice to see you, what's it like to be uh, chair? And in a quintessentially classical, philological way, he said to me, you know, the best thing you can say about a chair is that it's something you sit on. 
And I have been spending the past few months, eight months, sitting at my desk and organizing things uh, as best as I can, uh, writing emails and responding, and I really appreciated that, uh, that, uh, that insight that was brought back to me as I began my position. Um, but the other thing that you do when you sit on a chair is you have conversations with people. Um, and today is an occasion to have that kind of occupancy in a chair. Uh, because it's my very, very sincere pleasure to be with, uh, here with you and to be able to talk uh, a little bit about Melvin, Roger, who's, uh, Melvin Rogers, who's no stranger to us. Uh, and indeed, for those of you who have been coming to these lectures regularly uh, over the past few years, he was actually one of the organizers of the Wolfenstein lectures uh, in past years. Uh, today's coming to us from Brown University, where he is uh, currently Associate Professor of Political Science and the Associate Director of Brown Center for Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. He's one of the most distinguished, and I don't say this lightly, and most regarded political thinkers in the academy today, and one of the most inspiring. He is, if I may add something of my own, a political thinker about whom others will write books, not just whose books will be cited. In part, this is because of the importance of his ideas about the African-American tradition, about America's aspirational attitude towards democracy, or attitudes towards democracy, and about the important place that America's experience with slavery has in continuing to shape not just its institutions, but its ideals, and especially its habits of life. But when I say that he's not simply an author whom other authors will write about, um, but about whom they will write books, um, it is because of the compendium of his scholarly and writerly activities, both academic and public writing, that have slowly, consistently, and brilliantly helped us stitch together a tradition of writers in the African-American tradition of political thinking about democracy that had really not yet been brought together in the way in which it is now, thanks to his work. We're all familiar with the work of Du Bois, of Walker, of Ida B. Wells, Martin Luther King, and we know these to be notable fingers. But it took Melvin's contributions over the years to allow us to bring together a tradition of thought that goes hand in hand, but also well beyond a condition of suffering. The way he has done this is by showing us that a tradition of thought is not simply a compendium of transcribed ideas, but a community of sensibilities, of manners, of dispositions that collaborate in experiences like domination and slavery, about which it is inordinately difficult to abstract from. In his forthcoming book, and I can't uh, introduce him without uh, mentioning the, his forthcoming magnum opus, The Darkened Light of Faith, Melvin speaks of how the thinkers he presents to us, and I'm quoting from his introduction, which he shared with me, specifically and critically engage with the practices and habits of domination that emerge from white supremacy's hierarchy of value in the United States and believe they can use and redeploy the normative resources of democracy to imagine society anew. In doing so, he surprises us, as all great thinkers do, with two very basic insights that we must shoulder every day. The first is a provocation. Well, they're both provocations. How is it that the great contemporary thinkers in the United States who write so eloquently about freedom and domination have done so in complete disregard of a tradition of writers who endured the most atrocious experience of domination imaginable? And the second provocation is the following. How is it that in this intellectual and writerly tradition, born of the lived experience of chattel domination, that an aspirational light for democracy remains burning despite its obscured habitus. There are so, uh, some of my, the many provocations, these are some of the many provocations that Melvin's copious body of work provides, and they are provocations that are shared by the namesake of his lecture series, Victor Wolfenstein, whom we all know, who many years ago began to teach us, those of my generation, I should say, and Melvin's generation, uh, we're the same generation, sort of, close, uh, of aspiring academics that one can marry a tradition of tri critical political thinking with the lived experiences of cultures, and especially for, uh, for Victor of African American cultures. Of course, it's not for me to speak any further about uh, Melvin, but this is his time to speak to us. So please help me in welcoming back 
uh, to UCLA and, uh, and to welcome his lecture entitled today, James Baldwin on Racial Progress Without Redemption. Well, <laughs> Well, look, it is so great to see all of you. Um, and I immediately need to be quite, um, I just want to put on a timer. I immediately need to be um, uh, quite honest here. Um, obviously, I want to thank the Bell uh, and I want to thank Davide uh, for that extraordinary introduction. And sometimes introductions, just to be, not to undercut um, the introduction, and sometimes introductions um, really are. Uh, an accurate representation <laughs> of the person standing before you. And sometimes introductions, uh, even when they're not intended to be so, are aspirations toward which uh, the speaker is perpetually uh, aspiring, right? So, so thank you for the extraordinary introduction. Um, and it's gonna take time before I can really live up to it, <laughs> just to be honest. Um, I wanna thank um, Belinda and Toshi and Ria and Peter and all the uh, invisible labor uh, that made possible this event. And of course, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Judy. It's so great to see you again. Um, and I'm honored to speak um, uh, sort of under the name of uh, Victor Wolfenstein. Um, so the talk today um, is derived from the concluding chapter of my forthcoming book, uh, The Dark and Light of Faith, Race, Democracy, and Freedom in African American Political Thought. The book will be out in September, and I won't go through the whole argument, but what I will say is that the book is animated by a set of questions, two questions in particular. How should we understand the political, philosophical thinking of African Americans who so often found themselves, so often found themselves, dominated by the American society they so diligently sought to transform? What must their vision of democracy presuppose about the people uh, to whom they appeal and about the society in which uh, they lived? And part of what I try to uh, argue in the book, and I only will focus on this one piece, is that at the heart of their vision of democracy um, was, was an idea that democracy's legitimacy depends on aspirations that we're not just simply uh, speaking about those who are descriptively identified uh, by the Constitution, enjoying the rights and privileges as identified by the Constitution, but that democracy is also about a people not yet. A people that um, may yet come into existence. And that it is the fact of this aspirational view that actually legitimizes democracy. That is to say, it keeps you in the game when you lose. Because you come to believe that no defeat need be permanent. Right? One of the things that we come to discover by the time we get to the end of the book, I say a great deal of other things, is that aspirational politics so easily articulates with uh, various uh, visions of American exceptionalism, various visions of America as a, a shining city on the hill. And so part of what I found myself needing to do in the conclusion was to show why it is that my conception of aspirational politics as derived from the thinkers that I read from the 1830s to the, to the uh, 1960s guards against what I will call the, a kind of deformed aspirational politics. So today, in order to sort of dramatize that, I want to turn to that conclusion, and I really want to turn to the dominant model, and I'll say more about this in a moment, the dominant model of racial liberalism that defined the second half of the 20th century and what I will call its deformed aspirational politics. And we see this popularized in powerful form by the Swedish sociologist Gunnar Myrdal, and in particular in his 1944 work, An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem and Modern Democracy. And in that work, Miral deploys liberalism's commitment to freedom and equal regard and social justice to address racial inequality. 
And from the 1940s to the 1960s and beyond, racial liberalism shaped the social, legal, and economic engineering of the United States. Miral, I want to suggest to you, is a representative example of a way of thinking about the United States racial, uh, uh, racial history, its practices of discrimination, and its quest to realize a just society. And in American Dilemma, we find what I will call a once-born liberalism with little place for sin, tragedy, or anguish. To read Miral as I do is to get at his aspirational politics and the underlying attitude informing his vision. It is, I want to suggest to you, an attitude of evasion. And it remains with us today. And against the backdrop of Miral, I focus on one of the most critical responses of the period. Coming a little short of two decades later, the thinking of James Baldwin. His writings captured the public imagination and it shamed the political establishment as the black freedom struggle was coming clearly into view in the early 1960s. And we turn to Baldwin, well why do we turn to Baldwin? Well we turn to Baldwin because in him we find an attenuated aspirational politics born as it was from seeing both the promises and the betrayals of American life. In his writings, we discover his confrontation with the irrevocable deeds of white supremacy, and yet the necessity of responding to them all the same, because alas, we are responsible for the communities we inhabit. To call it irrevocable is to focus on the soul-scarring character of white supremacy, for which, as Baldwin says, neither he nor time nor history will ever forgive. And yet I want to insist that the scarred soul of the nation ironically shapes Baldwin's outlook, his view of identity, his view of history, and the central ethical themes that are central uh, or the central ethical themes that are important to his thinking, responsibility, forgiveness, redemption, and atonement. If Miral offers us an attitude of evasion, then Baldwin offers us an attitude in which we must be critically responsive to history. Baldwin's attenuated vision, I want you to see as productive. It demands that we remain alive to how the past bleeds into the present. Critical responsiveness is a central value of a democratic society, but especially one marked by deep practices of injustice and inequality. And in Baldwin's hands, critical responsiveness helps us to think less about progress as movement away from the past and more in terms of the skills with which we remain actively alert to the ways in which the past bleeds into the present. In commending critical responsiveness as an ethical and political virtue, Baldwin, I want you to see, resists the antinomies of redemption and irreparability, the antinomies of optimism and, pe and pessimism. So, there it is. Our journey begins with Miral, and we'll shift to Baldwin. And along the way, we'll encounter a number of other figures. We'll encounter the psychologist, William James. We'll encounter the philosopher, Sidney Hook. We'll, we'll encounter the cultural anthropologist, Margaret Mead. The political philosopher, Irish Marion Young. The philosopher and theologian, uh, Oziah Royce. But our main characters will be Miral and Baldwin. And I'll check on you midway, <laughs> OK? So, so go to Miral's An American Dilemma, 
represented a major statement on race and inequality when it was published in 1944. Doubting the ability of Americans to offer an objective analysis of race in America, the Carnegie Corporation commissioned the study in 1937 and selected the Swedish economist, Miral. And he, in turn, enlisted some of the most gifted scholars of race in the fields of psychology, sociology, and political science. In the study, Miral embraces a specific kind of moralism latent in American culture. He opens and closes the massive study, parts one and 11 respectively, by framing the problem of racial inequality in terms of the crisis of moral commitments. Among whites and their betrayal of what he takes to be, or what he calls the American creed. This moralism remains the most enduring part of that study, well over a thousand pages. The politics of the day and for several decades thereafter drew support from the study. Like any book, Framing matters. It's a crucial moment where one makes a choice. The decision to structure the book in the way he did shapes how we ought to understand the underlying ideological commitments of the American polity, the history of racial disregard, and the status of white Americans in responding to that problem. The book aspires to tell an origin story about who Americans are. And origin stories are quite interesting. They're determinative. Origin stories are about fate. They have, as Edward Said tells us, a divine, mythical, and privileged character that dominates what's derived from them. And this is why it is vital to me at all to sketch in the first chapter, as he says, the origins of the American creed. Behind racial inequality in the United States, he wants us to believe we discover a true community that beckons us, a vision of American identity in its pure form. And that pure identity is one that is committed, he insists, to freedom and equal regard, a creed that says everyone is worthy of respect and the opportunity to chart their own course in life insofar as it's consistent with others to do the same. The pure form of American identity and Miral's religious belief that American democracy is fated to win the battle against white supremacy brings to mind, for me, William James's classic account of the once born soul. Now, admittedly, Miral only invokes James once in American Dilemma. And even then, he doesn't reference James' 1902 work where he talks about the once born soul. So you might say, why? reach for William James. Well, I want to suggest to you that the heuristic of the once born soul best captures Miral's brand of liberalism. Heuristics are mental shortcuts that economize our thinking. And when they are about the world, they declutter the landscape. But sometimes, Heuristic can be, heuristics can be too neat. They engage in too much decluttering. For me, all that was actually the point. The American creed functions in this way, and behind that creed is the once born soul. But what is that? So in his varieties of religious experience, James distinguishes between two ideal types, once born and twice born souls. He acknowledges that most of us are of a mixed variety, but what is of significance is that these different types of souls embody attitudinal orientations toward life. The firstborn has a healthy-minded attitude, James says, and often, quote, looks on all things and sees that they are good. In the systematic variety of healthy-mindedness, he continues, it selects some one aspect of the world as its essence. 
and disregards the other aspects. In, the order, in order to resist humanity's constant struggle and violation of its own highest image, the once born consistently retreats to an affirmative description or an affirmative feature of human life and claims that feature to be the essence of what it means to be a human being. In contrast, James says, the twice-born soul sees both the light and the persistence of dark features of human life. The doctrine of the twice-born, he says, holds more of the element of evil in view. It is the wider view, James says. James's point is not that the once-born soul cannot acknowledge evils, but they factor, and this is important, as anomalies of human life, and thus the once born is prevented from accepting evils as a real feature, a real durable feature of human nature. As he says of the once born, the once born, uh, so for the once born, the world is a sort of one storied affair whose accounts are kept in one denomination, whose parts have just the value which naturally they appear on the surface to have. The once born, he says, lives on the plus side of life. The textual echo of the once born soul lives in the American dilemma, but to notice its workings, we must track Miral's description of the problem. In the introduction, he captures the heart of the issue. Here it is. The American Negro problem is a problem in the heart of the American. It is there that the interracial tension has its focus. It is there that the decisive struggle goes on. This is the central viewpoint of this treatise. Though our study includes economic, social, and political race relations, at bottom our problem is a moral dilemma of the American, the conflict between his moral valuations on various levels of consciousness and generality. So white Americans for Miral are pulled in two directions. On the one hand, they believe in freedom and equality, which defines the American creed. Yet on the other, there are a variety of prejudices against African Americans that portray that creed. For me at all, each white American carries within their breast this tension and it dogs their psyche and wreaks havoc on the external community in which African Americans live. Now, although Miral notes that there are no homogenous attitudes, but a mesh of struggling inclinations, interests, and ideas, he nonetheless maintains, and here is the point, that the American creed is the morally higher and truer value of American life. It is what he says directs American society. This is Miral isolating what he takes to be the essence of the American polity, as the once born soul often does. He treats the history of racial discrimination as an anomaly or an aberration within American life, and he thus set about the task of educating the citizenry to their true commitments. Miral partitions the past between those features that truly convey America's national ideals and those that reflect anomalies within the national identity. And this is why he says at the very outset of the text, and here I quote Miral, in principle the Negro problem was settled long ago, end quote. For him the scope of freedom was clear and the conditions of equality were properly understood, but the application of those values, the application was limited. Miller's text is not merely descriptive. It articulates a normative aspiration. His elevated notion of the national identity, of our national identity, it really does whisper, even today you can hear it, it whispers to our soul like ministering angels, and it comforts our heart. 
So it's unsurprising that American Dilemma became a text, not only for the academic, but for the lay person as well, as abridged versions were produced for the policymaker and student alike in the late 40s and in the 50s and in the 60s. And when you read American Dilemma, you know, there is a kind of contextual sensitivity at work in the text that really sort of anchors the reader. An American Dilemma is filled with extraordinary examples, both interpersonal and structural, of white supremacy and black domination. But what I want you to understand is that these examples, although quite important, they inhabit the text in a particular kind of way. And they shape how the nation should think about its identity and how the nation should think about the persistence of racial disregard. So ultimately, narrating the American dilemma works by fragmenting not what we remember, but how we remember it. Not what we remember, but how we remember it. The past flows away from us into the gutter of our horrible deeds, giving us the impression that they form no part of our shared identity, that they do not touch the nation's soul. The details of the past, most certainly are called forth and seemingly shape the present, but Muir sequesters them, allowing Americans to say in the 1940s, as we so often say today, that is not who we are. He encourages his readers to take comfort that the vision of life on display in the 1940s is not theirs. He sanctions the thought that the prejudices that constrain black night black life are not also of America's will. Ever on the quest for an unsullied national identity, Miral ironically deforms our way of seeing the full picture of our humanity. In that deformation, he leaves us less than human, less responsive to our shared, even if tragic, inheritance, and less attuned as a result to the sources of racial injustice. I admit that less than human may seem an exaggeration and a terrible indictment. But if part of being a citizen in a democratic society demands that we are responsive to our fellows, then the issue is not merely what we must as a society be responsive to, but why. Now, Miro is very clear about what the United States must address, but it isn't at all clear about why in the 1940s the United States found itself in need of a response in the first place. Just what is it about this country of ours that has given life to racial inequality? And at precisely this moment, and here now we begin the transition, we can hear James Baldwin's worry two decades later in his 1964 essay, The White Problem. The backdrop of this striking uh, essay is weighty, and it's worth sort of ticking off the notable events. The crisis of integration most visibly on display at the University of Mississippi and the ensuing white mob violence in 1962, the Birmingham Children's Crusade March in May of 1963, the Birmingham riot in May of 1963, the assassination of civil rights activist Medgar Evers in June of 63. The March on Washington in August of 1963. The horrific 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, bombing September 1963. And the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in November of that same year. The political climate was intense. But behind it all were past debts coming due and a nation in denial. What is most terrible, Baldwin says, is that American white men are not prepared to believe my version of the story in order to avoid believing that they have set up in themselves a fantastic system, here is the word, of evasions. A system that is about to destroy their grasp of reality, which is another way of saying their moral sense. Bless you. When Baldwin talks about the system of evasions, he often talks about it as Americans' insistence on their innocence. He uses innocence throughout his work to diagnose America's refusal 
to deal with their racial past. His, word, his use of the word innocence functions as a tool of political and epistemic analysis. Innocence for Baldwin denotes a kind of attitude or a point of view which he says infuses the cultural field of American life. And it shapes the outlook, he insists, of a great many white Americans in the United States. Innocence involves closing one's eyes to others in their kind of historical particularity, the person in front of you, with the details of their identity, to affirm an alternative and false reality. So what precisely is that false reality? Well, Baldwin says it in the same essay of 1964. Here it is. The people who settled this country had a fatal flaw. They could recognize a man when they saw one. They knew he wasn't anything else but a man. But since they were Christian, and since they had already decided that they had came here to establish a free country, the only way to justify the role this chattel was playing in one's life was to say that he was not a man. For if he wasn't, then no crime has been committed. That lie is the basis of our present trouble. Now, we will come back at the end to this language of fatal flaw. So just mark it in your mind for a moment. But something, is, something else is at work here. To confront black pain and death involves acknowledging something about one's community. Acknowledgement shatters illusions, something that Baldwin argues is a difficult, even if necessary, thing for a society to do. And here is the difficulty. The danger, he tells his nephew in the fire next time of 1963 in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity. Try to imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to find the sun shining and all the stars aflame. Any upheaval in the universe is terrifying because it so pr profoundly attacks one's sense of reality. Behind this remark is Baldwin's ongoing confrontation with identity as a form of estrangement and deformation. If he tries to enable black people to see their white counterparts, he also seeks to describe to white Americans the illusions that grip them and the cause. So his preoccupation in his writings and throughout his career, his preoccupation with identity is also a call for his fellows to be suspicious of how they think of themselves. Estrangement is about how the meaning of American identity evades the reality of historical inheritance. When white Americans narrate the meaning of the Civil War, Reconstruction, the Civil Rights Movement, or even today, the elevation of the first uh, African American president, these stories function as instances of the nation's latent com commitments made manifest. The power of the American origin story writing the course of events. These moments in American history are not interpreted as Baldwin would encourage us to do as deep criticisms of and tensions within the American polity. For that reason, the nation does not interpret them as departures, for example, from the founders' commitments. They do not, in other words, show us a scarred nation attempting to be born again. Deformation of our ethical capacities, the moral sense as Baldwin refers to them, results from estrangement. He argues that the intensity of one's attachment to the innocence of American life matches the ease with which one abdicates responsibility for the communities to which one belongs. People who imagine, he writes a year later in 1965, the white man's guilt, people who imagine that history flatters them are impaled on their history like a butterfly on a pen and become incapable of seeing or changing themselves or the world. Our ethical capacities matter not merely because they make us attuned to the world, but also because we find our ability to remake the world in that very attunement. 
And there's a striking implication. Baldwin asks his readers to consider that I think recasts the political goals of the United States. As a form of estrangement, American identity actually evades the demand that democratic freedom makes on it. As a form of estrangement, American identity actually evades the demand that democratic freedom makes on it. His picture of freedom is not novel. From the 1830s up until when Baldwin was writing, African Americans pushed against domination, but they also tried to get the nation to embrace what we might call a sort of non-sovereign understanding of freedom. Well, what does that mean? It just means that freedom requires cultural and institutional support, and thus requires that we be seen or taken in a certain way by our community to complete our freedom. So that freedom is not about mastery. The freedom's realization depends on fellows recognizing you in a certain way and institutions putting in resources to help support you as you try to have that freedom materialize in the world. So we are inescapably dependent on each other to realize freedom. But freedom, but freedom then means, because it's so bound to dependency, that we are perpetually vulnerable, potentially revealing the inadequacies or limitations of the identities on which we rely. However necessary, freedom turns out to be a hard thing to bear for those that claim innocence. And this is why Baldwin says at the very outset of his 1961 work, Nobody Knows My Name, a work that is actually ostensibly about Baldwin grappling with his own identity. But this is what he says. Nothing is more desirable than to be released from an affliction. But nothing is more frightening to be divested of a crutch, the crutch of innocence. And here, my friends, here is the rub. And however obvious it may seem, we must never tire of saying it and encouraging each other to accept the truth. The things to which one must attend do not disappear because we close our eyes. And the inherited costs display themselves in the form of reinscribed harms that nonetheless demand a response. This point of view gives us a very different take on the narration of American history, Reconstruction, the Civil Rights Movement, even black power. We're not merely sites of transformative possibilities, but the manifestation of repressed trauma haunting the present. Civic kinship does not dissolve because we refuse to acknowledge the claim it makes on us. So what are we to do? Baldwin thought that nothing short of a rebirth, nothing short of a rebirth will properly respond to this. A reawakening by embracing the nation's trauma as also what the nation is. Baldwin's plea is that Americans assume a different attitude, critically embrace their past, and allow both to structure a collective vision of responsibility. But just as Baldwin's, or but just as Mirdal's view involved a picture of innocence against which Baldwin railed, I want to suggest that it also involved a narrow conception of responsibility inadequate to the fullness of our history. And Baldwin offers us more. So stay with me. You all good? <laughs> all right. Let's keep going. So let's now set the scene. Baldwin, before an audience, 1963. Baldwin is with the American sociologist Nathan Glazer. He's with the American philosopher Sidney Hook. And he's with Miral. And they gathered for commentary symposium, liberalism and the Negro. Commentary is a monthly magazine founded by the American Jewish Committee Committee in 1945, quite popular and important by the 1960s. By the 1970s, it shifted toward neoconservatism. That's a different story, but it's an interesting one to tell. 
The symposium was subsequently published in 1964, marking the 20th anniversary of Miral's study. The symposium took stock of America's progress, African Americans' ethical and political status, and the nation's most significant dilemma. And one immediately notices that Baldwin stands apart from uh, his, liberal, his liberal counterparts. The focal point of tension in this symposium, this round table before an audience, the focal point of tension is not between Baldwin and, and Miro, as you might expect, given how I began, but it's not between those two, at least not directly. And it's not between Baldwin and Glazer that most scholars want to focus on. The heart of the disagreement, strikingly, is between Baldwin and Hook. Sidney Hook, the American pragmatist. Sidney Hook, the Marxist. Sidney Hook, the follower of John Dewey. So what's the conflict? Well, behind Hook's critical engagement with Baldwin is a broader concern about the role of history in thinking about ethical and political life. And Hook tells the audience that evening that the ethical principles of American life, basically the Declaration of Independence, must guide the citizenry. He concedes there is much to do to improve the life and standing of African Americans, but he insists that there is little doubt that the nation has made and will continue to make progress. And just at this moment, he directs his ire toward Baldwin. Baldwin's taken aback. To argue otherwise, Hook says, about the nation, as he claims that Baldwin does, is to, and here I quote him, to paralyze our ethical impulses. Throughout the exchange, Hook seems more consistent with Mira than Mira himself. <laughs> he leans into an ideological defense of liberal democracy that is indistinguishable from his appreciation of the United States as an ethical republic. To him, Baldwin looked more like the social protest novelist of Richard Wright. Uh, uh, and Hook, in 1949, had already gone after Wright and others for articulating disparaging views about the United States. The ideological context and Hook's politics of vindication shaped his attitude toward the past and thinking about racial justice and his account of responsibility. And this is what this is what Hook says. Those people in the South are not responsible for the initial acts, the initial acts which develop the situation in which they find themselves. They can be charged with responsibility for not playing a greater role in dealing with the Negro problem, but for not taking a more active part in the political process. But there's a tremendous difference between responsibility for a problem which we run away from and collective guilt for the crimes of racists. And we should observe two issues here. First, Hook conceives of the Negro problem as a problem for black people that is in need of being fixed by those that they share society with. This gives, I think, a specific character to the issue at hand. The problem adheres in the situation of African Americans. At one point, he says, it's the Negro's problem. And thus, Hook takes for granted the background institutional and cultural conditions of the United States. We do not, in other words, treat the problem as a feature of the historical development of American institutions and practices for which we ought to take responsibility. And this leads to the second observation that's quite important. In Hook's thinking, we can discern the outlines of what Iris Mary Young once called the liability model of responsibility. We must be able to assign culpability to agents causally tied to consequences for which responsibility is sought. I need to be able to identify you as the agent of a particular problem so as to identify you as also being responsible for it. And this leads Hook to suggest in the passage that I read that they were racist then, we are not now, and our responsibility extends no further than actions we in the present have committed. History remains, but its role is diminished, lest we endanger human agency and social transformation, lest we contribute to ethical paralysis. 
If the American creed is a once-born faith because it has little space for lasting anguish and little patience for the specters of the past, Baldwin's account is very different. Baldwin argues that the way to a new America must run through the trauma of black life, a twice-born faith in James's sense that does not remit the nation's failures but hold, holds promises and betrayals clearly in view. Hook's way of thinking reflects one of the most important entailments of American innocence, the idea that the citizenry stands exclusively within the present horizon of experience. But if that is your approach, it leads to a very clean American history, a very clean American story. And this, and this sort of clean story is precisely what connects Hook in the 1960s to Miller in the 1940s. Now, there were other ideas in circulation. Right? The idea that the present may bear the trace of a past from which the nation cannot finally escape. And Baldwin famously alerts his readers to this in The Fire Next Time, which I referred to very briefly in the introduction. This is the line that can find no home in Hook or me at all. This is the crime, and here is Baldwin, of which I accuse my country and my country men and for which neither I nor time nor history will ever forgive them, that they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of black lives. Destruction not only happened, but it continues anew. To speak as he does indicates that Baldwin is not merely interested in us recalling the past. It is not a question of memory, he says in 1955. The man does not remember the hand that struck him, Baldwin insists, the darkness that frightened him. As a child, nevertheless, the hand and the darkness remain with him, indivisible from himself forever, part of the passion that drives him wherever he thinks to take flight. To stand in an intimate relationship with the past requires us to acknowledge how it shapes the ground of our identity and the practical judgments that work themselves up in the form of words and deeds. Now, the foundational role that Baldwin accords history is likely to make some of us, maybe all of us, nervous. Worries over guilt and blame swirl about us when, we, when asked to see ourselves as responsible for the past. In our contemporary moment, I'm reminded of Republican Senator Mitch McConnell's response to reparations for slavery. Quote, I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago for whom none of us currently living are responsible is a good idea. For a society preoccupied with innocence and that thinks of responsibility always through a liability model, Baldwin will appear to be asking us to take the fall for something we did not do and over which we exercise no control. We heard it in Hook. And Baldwin, in his famous exchange with the cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead in 1970, you can hear it again. Baldwin asked her to think about our connection to each other across time and how the past may bind us. And to that suggestion, she responds, quote, I think if one takes that position, it's absolutely hopeless. I will not accept any guilt for what anybody else did. I will accept guilt for what I did myself. The reason, she continues, if we can't control it, we're not guilty. Now, despite Baldwin's claims, he's not really interested in blame or guilt. I'm not interested in anybody's guilt, he writes in 1964. I know you didn't do it, and I didn't do it either. To Mead's concerns, directly he says, but I'm not trying to make us guilty. Similar to Hook and Mead, Baldwin is after responsibility, but it is not of the liability kind. But I'm responsible for it, he continues, because I am a man and a citizen of this country, and you are responsible for it too. At just this moment, I think Baldwin's insight shines through, but it requires us to keep the connection between democratic freedom and dependency that I mentioned earlier in view. Freedom denotes dependency, the necessity of a kind of socio-institutional ecology that creates ethical and political conditions for us to complete our freedom. And in that case, the lack of a healthy ecosystem that produces and reproduces injustices will prevent freedom's realization. 
For Baldwin, we should not think of this as merely a structural institutional problem because reproduction also lives in us. It lives in our habits and our sensibilities. It lives in our manners. When these institutions are at work, they create an environment of identity formation that also bears our stamp. They reflect and reproduce who we are. They speak in our name. The reproduction of racial injustices across time requires a corresponding capacious idea of responsibility to match. What Baldwin is after in his writings, we find so nicely stated by Iris Marion Young, quote, Shared responsibility is a responsibility I personally bear, but I do not bear it alone. I bear it in the awareness that others bear it with me. Acknowledgement of my responsibility, and here it is, is also acknowledgement of the inchoate collective of which I am a part, which together produces injustices. Our racial history thus requires that we view responsibility as something we can share even when we cannot causally see such acts as flowing from our will. So Baldwin thinks we awaken our responsibility by holding the nightmare in view. Hook suggests otherwise. Hook thinks the American creed can only survive by being released from its burdens. Hook and Mirar were uninterested in asking the questions that Baldwin thought we must ask. How should we stand to the irrevocable deeds of white supremacy? What is the fate of responsibility in a democratic society marked by deep practices of injustice and inequality? What is left of aspirational politics if the past always haunts the present? We now move finally on the last leg. You still all with me? Come on. All right. So where have we been? So I've sketched a point of view that Baldwin asks us to assume. It involves us rejecting the idea of our racial innocence in order to accept the fullness of our past. That is, to be critically responsive to it. But in doing so, we also, we're also positioned to embrace a form of freedom now adequate to meet the demand of our shared democratic life. And with this understanding of freedom as a kind of shared social phenomena, comes a corresponding robustness to our view of responsibility, what I have called the shared idea of responsibility. But there is still one lingering issue that needs to be addressed, which is now about the weightiness of our history. And it comes in the form of the very notion of an irrevocable deed I mentioned in the introduction. For if deeds are irrevocable and their consequences seem to extend into the present, it's not clear why one would ever attempt to respond. One might worry that how Baldwin asks us to think about the past threatens to endanger the very notion of aspirational politics. His claim in the fire next time that the country's crimes against black people are something for which he nor time nor history can ever forgive or his insistence in the white problem that the act of enslavement was the country's fatal flaw seems to deny transformation. And the reason we are likely to think this, if we do, is because of how we have historically envisioned American politics. For if aspirational politics holds out the possibility of change and progress where racial justice is concerned, it must be rethink because the nation can redeem itself. Progress, we so often think, must imply absolution or it must imply salvation. We have to think about this differently. To take Baldwin seriously requires us to disentangle progress from redemption. This isn't a tactic and it isn't a program. It is an attitude or a mood that nurtures democracy and tries to sustain the citizenry for an incomplete and dare I say perhaps incompletable journey. I don't think, Baldwin says to Hook in that round table discussion, we can discuss the ethical character of the nation. I don't think we can discuss this properly unless we begin at the beginning. End quote. 
When he asks us to return to the beginning and the weightiness of our past, he asks us to think of the nation as Osiah Royce once thought of an individual that wrecked their moral universe. Here is how Royce put it in that extraordinary work of 1913, The Problem of Christianity. Here is our last conversation partner. I mean, listen to Royce. In his own deed, he has been false to whatever light he then and there had and to whatever ideal he then viewed as his highest good. Hereupon, no new deed, however good or however faithful and however much of worthy consequences it introduces into the future life of the traitor and of his world can annul the fact that the one traitorous deed was actually done. For Baldwin, the deeds are the enslavement of black people in the corresponding hierarchy of value we call white supremacy. He cannot absolve white Americans of a deformation they initiated in the nation's name. And this point holds even as he encourages his nephew to accept them with love. Baldwin asks his black audience to love white people, but he also thinks this goes a long way in unburdening black people from saving their white counterparts. Love is powerful, but the, but the work of civic love always requires partners. The love from black people may point the way to accepting one's past and is therefore important in that regard. But, and here is Baldwin, until they understand their history, they cannot be released from it. And time and history cannot serve in these roles either. Although they are useful in marking the temporal distance from one's beginning, they cannot dissolve the inherited consequences of those actions. To be released from the past or forgiven for it, Baldwin um, is thinking about these in the same way, is not the same as absolving one of the horrors that the past represents in time. In his conversation with Margaret Mead, he refers to this as the dynamic in time. Those deeds are irrevocable, and they seeded the political and ethical life that we now live. To this thought that Baldwin shared with Margaret Mead, she recoiled in the transcript. It's, just, it's outlined. Then we've nowhere to go, she says. And perhaps now it appears that we've run into a problem. Maybe you think that Baldwin has now seemingly traded in one origin story for another, that in abandoning the expansive optimism of, of the American creed, he has embraced a de debilitating pessimism. That's what Hooke was concerned about. And Baldwin says, no, because we have atonement. To atone is to engage in reparative work. It orients the soul as one undertakes the work of correction, of improvement, of development. An atoning community looks backward to the beginning that has given life to the harms, is perceptually attuned to how the harms ripple through time, and engages in ameliorative actions so that those in the future may live more humanely in the light of their past. Atonement gives a specific meaning to our present actions in redressing racial inequalities and injustices and contrasts quite sharply with the discourse of redemption. Redemption, just so we understand, would aim to restore that which was broken and to deliver us from the harms that follow as a result. To be, to take the famous example, right? to be, for example, redeemed through Christ is to be delivered from one's sins. Christ on the cross is a powerful and rich image. It represents the emptying of the self in the form of sacrifice for humanity, thus releasing us from our sins. Baldwin never invokes Christ in this regard. There is no narrative of escape, no redeemer, and no metaphysical certainty guaranteed to us by our origin story. And with that, Baldwin dispenses with redemption. And we should do the same. While it is true that the normative vision of democracy encourages us to dream and dream again, while it is true that this normative vision has served as an important reservoir from which others have drawn uh, in their struggle for justice and in securing a bit of it, the fact remains that our quest for national absolution is destructive. It leads us to attach too much value to victories, <laughs> 
of racial progress and to read our historical successes as redemption. It encourages us to believe it is permissible to monetize and materialize the reparative work of atonement. It encourages uh, or it obscures that reparation, for example, is an ongoing, never-ending struggle of bending the nation's will toward freedom and equality. It blinds us to the fact that responding to our racial history similar to living our democracy depends on what Baldwin says are choices, and here I quote him, choices we have got to make forever and ever and ever, every day. If our history of racial disregard lives in us, Baldwin insists, Baldwin insists, it follows that even our affirmative confrontation with it only makes sense because we embrace the past. Or to put it differently, our affirmative gestures of redress, legal, social, or cultural, are only intelligible because they bear the trace of a stain we have inherited. We can atone for our racial crimes, but even through our reparative work, we are reminded of the fatal betrayal, the fatal flaw. Now maybe in this final moment, maybe, this will feel to some of you like a terrible conclusion and an offense to freedom and agency in the way that it felt to hook. In a few lines, you might think I have betrayed the very meaning of aspirational politics. But I want you to understand where Baldwin's aspirational politics begins and where it leads. How does one think about the development of self and society if not by tracking how both grapple with the darkest features within? And Baldwin's vision is not about overcoming, thus escaping our trauma, but often living in the light of a trauma that constantly threatens to invade our lives. To assume this point of view, to take it on, involves a radical transformation. It envisions a society struggling to remain alive to the danger of its racial past and the present, to be perceptually on alert to how it might display itself in time. And this is why Baldwin describes, consistently describes our confrontation with our past as a battle. We do not find success in defeat in the past, but in preventing it from becoming tyrannical. Being alive to our beginning may permit us, as Eddie Glaude would put it, to begin again. We don't overcome our national trauma and we do not secure salvation from our inheritance. But in struggling with and against both, we potentially communicate new senses of worth and value to each other through words and deeds. This is community work, the hard work of democracy, and it can also be the darkened light of our faith forged through the tragedy of our history. Thank you.